Well, hello, Gwen. Thanks for having me on your show. Um, my name is Trina Casey. Um, I am a multi-passionate uh, uh, storyteller. I write children's books that teach emotional intelligence, as well as in being an EQ coach and a cognitive behavioral therapy coach. Um, I also um, am doing a lot of other things, but I also have a podcast as well called EQ Above IQ, Parenting with Emotional Intelligence and Healing the Inner Child. So that's me. <laughs> yeah. So we met through Six Seconds, right? The Emotional yes. Intelligence Network. And so maybe it makes more sense for us to start off by talking about emotional intelligence. Yes. So yeah, maybe tell me a bit more about your podcast and what it was that, you know, inspired you to start it. Okay, well, First of all, I started actually started the children's books first because I, I like 15 years ago, I discovered um, Six Seconds and I actually had Josh Freeman on, on my podcast and I was telling him how uh, I found his, I ordered his little binder book on how to become more emotionally intelligent and because I was in a very unhappy marriage at the time and I wanted to really teach those foundations and the five principles to my child and I ended up integrating them into storytelling with my books because I just felt like as I was searching for stories to help my son deal with bullying at school and being biracial and a lot of just life skill things, there was nothing there for children to learn about emotional intelligence and like the five principles, uh, you know, self-awareness, self-regulation, motivation or purpose, um, uh, compassion, especially self-compassion and uh, social skills, or I like to call it community skills, how we get along with each other. And so I just feel like, you know, for the most part, we've been thrown to the wolves and trying to figure it out. And here it is, this perfect um, kind of key to unlock this door of getting along together as a species. And we haven't been utilizing it, you know? So yeah, that's, I just really am a strong proponent for, for emotional intelligence. And I know that I'm working on cultivating it every day in myself. So, mm. so <laughs> yeah, you said you started off with the stories. So these are books that you've written yourself. What form, yes. what form is yes. it? Yeah, I wrote so far it's three books. Uh, the first book was Galaxy's Well. And that is a children's book about a little um, biracial princess who, who has an out-of-body metaphysical experience and gets to um, travel in the mouth of a well named um, Star, but she meets a, a unicorn on the beach called Galaxy. Um, and so she travels to this magical world and, you know, she's like typical every little girl um, or person, because even boys go through this, um, where they're unsure of themselves and, and always comparing themselves to other people. And she suffered the loss of her mother. And um, I, I just really wanted to write something dedicated to that and, and, and kind of like let children know that they can always speak their truth. I mean, she's kind of suffering silently and that kind of, um, that affected her self-esteem. So she went into this fantasy world to really discover who she was. And she just blossomed into this beautiful fae fairy and, and she, she looked the way she wanted, she felt the way she wanted. And then she had to choose to stay or come back. And so it's just about those hard decisions and how we get through them. And, um, and in the back of all my books, there is um, a quest Q&A that you can, parents can, and caregivers can work with their kids and kind of explain the story in deeper detail. And, um, and then there's um, I Love Pink, a Trans Tale. And so I'm a real big ally of the LGBTQ community. Um, I consider myself a member and, um, you know, I have trans cousins and I have uh, a lot of friends who are trans and I have, um, my sister is gay and, you know, that's just been a part of my circle since 
for a very long time. And so I felt like there were no children's books explaining their experience and the profound emotional intelligence they actually have um, because they're so self-aware. You know, it's something about not knowing, well, knowing that you're in the wrong body and then trying to find a way and the strength and the support to have that expression um, is something we can all learn from, whether you're cisgender or gay or whatever. So, and then the third book is, is called Leo the Technicolor Panther. And that is actually a collaborative book that I do with my Mindful Stories Tellers class, which is a writing class where I teach them the five principles of emotional intelligence through the writing process. So it's, it's, that's a fun class, I enjoy that one. I love the sound of these stories. I would definitely have <laughs> <laughs> had those in my bookcase as a child. I, yeah, I've had adults tell me that they needed to read that story. And while reading the story, their inner child just like got a lot of healing and even cried, you know, with their child. And I always like, oh, tears are always good. Tears are always good. <laughs> So I'd like it to get it out to a broader audience. You know, it's, it's doing okay, but the publishing industry is its own little uh, gatekeeper in itself, so. Yeah, well, I was wondering kind of how you'd distributed these so far, because it sounds like something that, you know, every school should have these books lying around. You know, I, you know, I get these little trickling of surprises where I get a um, school district send me an email saying they'd like to use the book um, for Chicago uh, as a curriculum. Um, that was really cool. And, 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 or if I go on vacation, um, I was traveling with my son in Egypt and a teacher um, asked me the name of the book. She goes, I just recently saw your book. It has a well on the front of it, doesn't it? And I go, Yes. <laughs> and so you get those little pleasant things where it's touching. And I got a beautiful Kirkus review on Galaxy as well. So that, you know, it takes time. And when you don't have the machine, because I self published, um, you don't have the machine behind you to push it out to the masses, then it's a lot slower in process. So. Yeah, that's often the problem, right? Not having mm -hmm. the system behind you. And uh, you mentioned the storytelling classes as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, tell me more about that. What does that look like? Uh, well, the storytelling classes, oh, you would love these classes because it falls in line to what we were talking about, con community and connecting with each other. Um, so basically I take kids between 10 and 16, and then adults are 16 and up. Um, and what we do is we collaborate on a story. So through that process, I teach him the principles of emotional intelligence. So self-awareness, who is this character? What are they really about? And I take them through the development part of who the characters are. Where are their traumas? Where are, what are the difficult things? What's their thorn? What's their rose? And I um, also do a lot of listening exercises when I'm with the class. It was in person, which I love. And um, now everything's turned online. But, you know, I have a Native American talking stick that I pass around and uh, created and made. And um, you pass the, the, the thing about Native American, everything is about the, the exchange you know, whether it's with nature or with each other. Um, so the person holding the stick is the person speaking and they're talking about whatever we're talking about. And then once the stick is passed, the next person has to reiterate exactly what they heard to work on listening skills and understanding. And so we go around the room and we do that. There's meditation, there's sound therapy, um, during that process as well and by the end um by the end we have created this story that i copyright i do i take all the idea the concepts and i make it into a cohesive story and um but the whole time they're learning all the the principles of eq so 
It's, uh, it's fun. And then I give everybody in the class a copy of it with their name in it, and they even illustrate it as well. Mm. So, cool. No, I love the sound of that. Okay. I've been getting more and more into storytelling recently, or maybe, you know, recognizing that I was always a storyteller, or always someone who loved stories, like mm -hmm. most humans are, I suppose. Yeah. And, um, yeah, obviously, the title of this podcast video series is the story in you and when I said that to you you seem to resonate a lot with that idea so mm -hmm. I'd love to ask you just you know what does storytelling mean for you and why is it so important oh wow well, our stories create our reality that's why it's so important you know storytelling is an ancient shamanic um, tradition basically. Um, before there was the written word, there was always the spoken word. And that's how we were taught how we became um, the histories of our family. We have that old uncle. I remember when I was uh, this and that, and this happened. We used to listen to our elders through storytelling. And one of the most the reason why movies and media are so captivating and is because it tells a story. I think it's in our nature to gravitate to trying to understand and stories help us understand who we are, who we were and who we will be. So yeah, that's what it means to me. <laughs> yeah. And then how does EQ weave in? I mean, I know you've said, you know, it helps to have storytelling as a method, right? To communicate these ideas of EQ to children, maybe to adults as well. Adults too, inner child, tell you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I guess also having a podcast, right? That's another way of sharing people's personal individual stories again to yes. illustrate that idea. So yeah, what, what are some of the most interesting things you've learned during this whole journey so with the podcast with the storytelling with the writing wow one of the things that I've discovered which is really kind of sad but I think that everyone understands is just how lonely people are how desperate we are missing the connection that we used to have as a community and I feel like the push towards individualism has been a detriment to the collective and our well being. And um, so, when I am talking to people on my own podcast, it is amazing that the similarities are universal on where everyone is suffering or has suffered. And everybody wants to be pretty much at the same place, which is kind of this peaceful and balanced kind of place of gratitude. But I feel like we've all lost our way. And, and I think that it kind of is why storytelling has always been my thing, because I just really want to understand the why in life. And, um, once we get underneath and understand the root of why we have all this dis-ease, you know, and that manifests both physically, psychologically, you know, dis-ease is not feeling easy in ourselves anymore. Um, I think we could really create a much healthier reality for everyone, you know? So that's what the EQ journey in weaving it in stories has really done to me. I think it makes it more di digestible and not just sort of the, the newest fad, you know, in healing, you know, um, not that I knock meditation, not that I knock any of those modalities. I think just storytelling is pulls you in and helps you remember more. And it's actually cognitively proven <laughs> that storytelling is the most effective way to teach and learn 
And at the same time, it's the most effective way to brainwash people, right? Into Woo! <laughs> you said it. You said it. That's what the TV and the movies and the propaganda and social media, all that is, they know how the human brain ticks. And um, it's been good used for good and evil. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I was just thinking to, you know, this idea uh, in the book Sapiens that you all know Harari talks about that. I love that book. Yeah. So, you know, like the shared fiction, right? Like having a shared narrative is what's maybe enabled us to pull off these massive feats, <laughs> like creating oh. global civilization. But yeah. At the same time, yeah, there's been a lot of very problematic stories as well that people have come to believe. You know, I'm always fascinating. Uh, it's always fascinating to me how certain people like can really gravitate and hold on to these these fables or um, non truths. Um, you know how the cult mentality works, and it just to me, it's just it just it's just an extension of like that need to belong and the need, the need for community. You know, people will latch on to things like QAnon or, or um, Manson or all these other like really cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs people because they have been so effective on their delivery of the story. You know, and that goes back to ancient times where they took a little bit of truth and ran with it and just, it just exploded out into this non-truth you know like it could have started out as a little true <laughs> but they took it to their benefit yeah and I think by mentioning belonging you've hit on to the other big thing right like people want to make sense of their world and people want to belong to some group and they want to feel accepted so I guess storytelling was always a kind of community weaving activity and now mm -hmm. it can be used to yeah, draw people into these kind of areas of false belonging, right? And yeah. I don't know if you know um, Tokopa Turner. She does a lot of beautiful dream work stuff, but her book mm -hmm. Belonging mentions this, you know, this desperate need to belong will often leave us in false belonging. And the way to recognize that is, you know, if you speak up, if you say what you really think or need and you no longer are allowed to belong there, then, mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't really belonging in the first place. Mm -hmm. It was, it was, um, what's the word I want to say? Um, it was indoctrination, mm. Yeah. you know? And, you know, that's religion. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. you can't be different and still believe what we believe. And anything, I just believe anything that makes you feel unworthy or guilty or um, any of the other negatives, then it's not a positive. So, but it's an effective um, vehicle for control. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. so, so we can see, right, stories and our need to belong have been used a lot to lead us down a lot of paths <laughs> and so yeah. how do we harness that for something good I guess oh I just think more voices need to be spoken speaking and talking about their stories because I think one of the reasons why abuses are allowed to continue is because those abuses are silenced and whether it's children who have been, you know, essayed and are that sexually assaulted, or who have women who have been raped. There's always a shame in a silencing campaign um, attached to that. But as time has gone by and more voices have lifted up, we can see how just absolutely rampant the problem is. And now there is a change that is demanded because more women and more children and more people are like hey that happened to me too 
you know? So that's why telling your story is vital, you know? Silence breeds, um, you know, negative things like abuse. And then learning how to take the shame out of that. Um, and even blame because, you know, I had an interesting conversation with somebody, sort of a debate. He had been um, sexually assaulted. And this is all around the Johnny Depp thing. <laughs> and um, I, I said to him, and it was a woman that did it. And I said, was she physically abused as well? And he's like, well, it doesn't it make excuses. I said, there's no excuse for sexual assault of any kind, but there is always a reason. And once we get to the reason, we can stop it from happening. We can't just say it's bad and move on. We have to say it's bad. This is where it came from. And now how do we solve it? It's been this long campaign to just categorize things, but not really fix them, you know? Like we have a mental uh, illness title for everything, but have we gotten really deeply underneath? Why and why does it persist? You know, so those bigger whys are the reason why, but those bigger whys are what run the world. So it sounds like you are a storyteller and a truth seeker as well. <sighs> to a fault. <laughs> <laughs> I think sometimes, you know, I talked to my son about this. I said, you know, he goes, mom don't ruin it like I talk about something he's telling me that I, I said well you know why because this this and this he goes no no don't tell me <laughs> and there's this part of me that this is loves the magic and the fantasy of things because I love that because I think there's so much magic in the world but I just think we're explaining it in the wrong way <laughs> and we are sidestepping the truth of things just to stay in the fantasy and stay in this reality and it's not a healthy reality and you know if we bring eq into that i would suspect you know there are emotions that come up when we confront painful truth right we don't want to look at what we're doing to the planet and what we're doing to each other because obviously it doesn't feel good emotionally physically and so I think most people just choose what feels comfortable, which is let's make it very, very binary, simple, mm -hmm. good and bad. Yeah, we don't want to have conversations about how did this person come to be a yeah. criminal. We just want to say they're bad, lock them away. Let's move yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah, well, we're not, we're going to have a cycle that keeps continuing. But that cycle pro is a profiting, profits certain people, you know? If we solve the problem, certain people stop profiting. And um, in a capitalistic world, you know, um, pain and suffering is um, monetarily beneficial. Yeah, well, this is part of the problem. So let's talk about the story of capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. I, 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 again, I see people going into the kind of binary thinking like, oh, capitalism is evil. Therefore, what is the good, you know? And again, of course, it's not so simple. It's always going to be very complex. But in the spirit of, you know, weaving a new story for humanity, um, I'm really interested in this idea of moral imagination, you know, mm. using our imagination to project forward into the future, for example, to help us dream up, you know, what kind of future do we want to live in, right? Because we can imagine mm. 
the apocalyptic worst case of what happens if we continue on the current course. Yeah, what kind of alternative futures can we tell the story of, you know, so that we can move closer to that being a possibility? So that's what I want to ask you is what kind of future do you imagine that gives you hope and moves you forward? Oh, wow. That, I think about this all the time, you know? Um, the type of future I imagine is, first of all, the, the, the dismantling of patriarchal um, and <laughs> colonialist mindsets. Um, and in that, a lot of the narcissism that it, it exists in this world would also be dismantled and looked down upon because it is a dis destructive nature that we have taught ourselves, been taught, um, and teach our children uh, like this um, competitive and, and, and you know, uh, survival of the fittest attitude that is actually environmentally destructive because it's about who has the most and um, rather than who has what they need. So my, my vision of a future is definitely more egalitarian in that um, the current systems in place that stop us from being accountable without feeling like we're bad people, go away. Um, accountability and vulnerability, I think is a super superpower. And once you can do those things, you actually build better community because there's trust and there's a feeling of safety um, and you're heard. You know, I think that's probably with children, especially, um, they don't feel heard, you know, and they're born like with all this innate wisdom until we kind of like drain it out of them. Uh, <laughs> and then, um, so, you know, where, you know, I'm not saying money has to go away. I'm not saying luxury things have to go away, but I would say that the playing field would be equal if there were no such things as um, inheritance, you know, the, the deer, the dog, the cat, the everything else, when they die, they die. Don't, they don't get to leave a fortune to the next generation to rule over and continue ruling over the masses. So what I see now is the reality of a few forced upon the majority. And the majority feels sick and, and out of balance because of that. So if we can eliminate some of that, you know, and, and equally distribute some of that, because we have, a, we have enough resources, they're just being hoarded. And uh, so that laws and legislations that would in that would end a lot of problems. And especially the ones where, you know, recently where men are telling women how to use their bodies, you know? You know, that need for control and that need come from control comes from insecurity. Yeah, and I think about this a lot too, because I'm, I'm like you, I'm a truth seeker. I always want to know why, I guess, mm -hmm. just having an academic background, psychology, you know. So when I think about this, I think, yeah, but that insecurity or that fear, right? That fear of not having control. That's where this all comes from. Mm -hmm. But why, again, and I can firstly think there's a very long, long ancient story of trauma, right? Of people who didn't have control, not just yeah. from each other, but from like you know, nature. Like we used to be hanging out with saber-toothed tigers and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
not like when we talk about nature connection here in you know your oh, we we like we were <laughs> we were we were meat <laughs> yeah we're some predators you know right and and you know this is the privileged thing when we talk about oh go to the forest and connect and it's like you can't do that in a lot of the world even today right there are snakes there are bears like hunters i don't know it's not not really a safe world and so it makes sense to me that we would have tried to control that so that we could feel safe but mm. it's you know that's that's where i find myself thinking okay is there a way to convince people to give up security that's the thing you know and but is security really real mm. is it really real <laughs> no it's false it's a false sense of security because you can like you know you could be that wealthy person and have all the money in the world and then boom get hit by a bus yeah you could you know all of a sudden have a heart attack um there's no such thing as in as security anyway i just think that humans never well not not i won't say all humans i know aborigine people aboriginal people accept the impermanence of their life they accept it and that's why they live happier fuller lives because they're not trying to make sure everything is just so they're enjoying the moments that they have with their family and with their friends and um, they're not thinking so much of the future the way that the current system is um, in place. So I think that we could just learn, go back and learn from the people who, who are, you know, um, disenfranchised yeah. and say, okay, life is too short for me to be worried about surviving all the time because the the planet could blow up at any moment and guess what there's nothing I can do about it you know yeah and I it makes me think um yeah detaching from this very specific idea of what your life has to look like right which again was fed to you by the mainstream story of oh you got to buy a house and get a job and save up money and do all of these things because mm -hmm. a lot of the time I think the people who are feeling a lot of anxiety right now about the future and climate change a lot of those people are actually fine right now right it's mm -hmm. just that they have um they're afraid of losing that privilege they're afraid of losing the comfort and the false security yeah. and yeah at the same time I mean, I think people who are living on the front lines of climate change, they don't have time for that. They're just, we're here. I don't know. Um, tell me a little bit about where you live at the moment and how, how are things there? Things here have gotten extremely expensive. <laughs> um, I lived in Amsterdam and um, before I moved here. And because of COVID and the impact on my co the companies I shared with my ex, you know, money got funny. And because we live within the system as the system is. Um, so I, we moved here to Mauritius and, you know, it's a lot cheaper, but I can feel, still feel the pinch as the cost of food goes up because I just told my son today, it's like, it's amazing to me that these people are so um, greedy that basic foods are now becoming so expensive and people can't afford to buy them, feed them. And that's what happened when we gave up our autonomy around our ability to be self-sufficient or they took it from us through laws and legislations. I think I mentioned it before you and in some places in the US, you can't even have a garden of vegetables and, and or collect rainwater. 
um, or you get fined. You can't live off the electrical grid or you get fined. Um, Land of the free. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's another fallacy. Um, I don't know where there is freedom, but I tell you here, everybody's a lot more relaxed because that's typical of island life. Almost, you know, coming from the, you know, dot your I's, cross your T's um, environment I'm from, it can be annoying. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, I'm supposed to have somebody here dealing with my internet. Uh, it's been going on a week now. And, <laughs> and it's just, it slows you down. And, but it also puts in perspective of what's important. They're not worried about it. It'll get done when it gets done. Hopefully it'll get done, but you'll survive, you know? And that's the whole thing. You, it's amazing when you have less, how you're able to appreciate that you can still survive without it. Because that whole, as you put it, that duh, 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 everything has to be parceled up in tiny time increments then again it comes from that need to control everything right and that fear again of uncertainty loss of control yeah it comes from fear and comes from from feudal european systems of of hierarchy and control well i just got a book yesterday called the colonization of time with i'm really mm. going to reading <laughs> oh that sounds good mm. <laughs> Because our time is colonized, isn't it? We always have to do things. Punching. I had a nightmare that I had forgotten to punch my clock on my time card. And I didn't, wasn't able to get paid. And I just, I, it was a tangible fear that I felt because the only reason why is because I forgot to punch the time card. Yeah. That was like my real job once. <laughs> yeah. It was mine too. <laughs> oh, it's horrible, isn't it? Yeah, if we were one second late back from a break, we had to fill a form explaining why we were late. And you know, these are adults being treated like this. I mean, that's just the tip of the iceberg, but yeah. So talking about stories, um, mm -hmm. I'm wondering, is there, a story like a work of fiction about the future that you really like because I just I always had a thing for dystopian <laughs> fiction but you know it's nice sometimes to also try and find positive stories about the kind of world we'd like to live in uh, so yeah mm -hmm. is there anything that comes to mind interesting enough I'm working on a book right now in my limited times <laughs> that is about that talking about our, our humanity or lack thereof, the alienness of everyone on this planet and how some live um, very detached from it because they are from, not from here. And so um, that's a work in progress, but a story that, let me think. You know, um, I just discovered something um, called the man that fell from uh, fell to earth, and it's I and I know it's originally a book, but there's an amazing new uh, series that just started. Yeah, yeah, and um, two of my favorite actors too um, are are leading. He played Sam Cooke in his life story, um, but it's about an alien who comes to Earth. And the the imagery, you know, I'm I'm very much into reading ancient texts like the Sumerian tablets and things like that too. You know, I studied Egyptology in school. I wanted to be Egyptologist because I was like, something's not right, you know. <laughs> so um, the origin stories of things, you know, I've always been fascinated with. So when the, the 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 alien comes he's in the center of earth and he looks like a reptile and he's got the slanted eyes and then he metamorphoses into the human form 
and it's painful looking and he crawls out into out of this crater and it and he's learning to be human with all the fumbles and and he's he, he, you know he seems neurodivergent in so many ways and i've had some conversations with people lately about what neurodivergent is and i go I, i'm pretty sure i'm neurodivergent <laughs> And in that I've always been that kid um, that didn't particularly fit in. I could fake it really well, but when everybody was thinking one way, I was already thinking in another, you know? You you relate from what I can see. <laughs> yeah, and I'm all, all the best people, <laughs> I think. It's like, I feel really detached sometimes. And as I've gotten older and I've decided not to wear that mask anymore, I find having those type of friendships, um, superficial friendships, challenging, you know, because people don't get that I want to talk about things that matter. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. that's, that's the story that I think that. Okay, okay the man felt uh, and uh, yeah, man yeah, it reminds me of a another book I was reading called Humans or something, and it was a similar thing, like this alien trying to figure out human society. Maybe it's quite yeah. a popular trope because we like to hold up that mirror <laughs> to ourselves. But, I think a lot of us don't want to be human anymore. Yeah, yeah. There's a yeah, the shame inside i think that most people are trying to dodge that accountability you know yeah i think so and i think you know there's a discussion about this in the kind of climate sphere that this narrative of like oh humans are evil humans are a plague upon the earth and we're destroying it like this isn't really helpful story either mm -hmm. right because no. what do we, what do you do with that right what do you do with that feeling and that story it's not going to movie no it's just it's just doing what we've always done is creating an insecurity and a self-loathing if you you don't have compassion for yourself or love for yourself you don't love anyone else you don't love anything else so that's the opposite of what we need to be doing we need to be really understanding the why and then having compassion for for that journey because of the why because we didn't really choose it well exactly we were born into this society and you know the other thing is yeah saying that humans are bad and the earth would be better off without them that kind of discounts all the indigenous people who are still protecting 80 percent of the world's diversity and you know living much more in harmony with the earth right and yeah all the people who are trying to make things better it's just that there are some humans we might not want to relate to <laughs> and that's yeah and those are the humans ruling the roost that's the problem those yeah. are the ones that you know what's always amazing to me is how we um we cut off our power source. We as a collective are so powerful that if we wanted something to change tomorrow, all we'd have to say is this is going to change tomorrow. And it might be uncomfortable for some people, but it's the only way that we've ever had anything shift. You know, Why? union unions like there used to be a time when you worked and worked and worked and died working and then unions got together and you know amazon just got parts of their company unionized so that you could have decent working hours and then you know i just always am saddened by our lack of awareness around how much we do have control over and we believe in other narratives because we're fed that all the time 
Yeah, exactly. The narrative of hyper individualism. Right? <sighs> yeah, it's another huge thing. Yeah. So maybe that's yeah. that's the thing to think about for people watching. Like, what are the stories and narratives that you know you just take for granted, and what are some other alternative stories out there? Yeah, those stories. The individualism is making us very lonely, and that's another disease that's coming coming up a lot. You know, social media was supposed to make us social but it actually has done the opposite of that. You know, it's kind of cool because like I said, there's this duality with everything. We have never physically met, but I feel like I know you because we've had some conversations, we've chatted, and, you know, there feels a sense of connection. You know, like if I saw you on the street, I'd give you a big hug and you wouldn't be a stranger to me anymore. Um, and so it's, there's these positives, but it's just so many of the, the, the negative attributes of social media exist and that you're watching people that you think are more, you're comparing yourself more beautiful, more thin, when they're actually using filters. Yeah, which is another, that's their storytelling device, right? Everyone's telling a story about their lives and stories are always not 100% of the accurate details of what happened. It's just mm -hmm. a way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So uh, let's let's bring this to a close because of course we can't <laughs> talk for much longer. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Yeah. So what is one last thing that you would like to share? Is there anything that you feel you haven't said yet that you'd really like to say? I think I, for as far as who I am, what I do, I think I've said it all. What I really want more people to do, which is been basically we've been told not to do is reach out to people more. Don't be afraid to say I need help. You know, don't be afraid to say I'm struggling because you're not alone. And sometimes another person needs to hear that. And also don't be afraid to take on a little bit of somebody else's stuff because that's how they're going to know that, you know, they're going to be able to take on some of your stuff because that's how community works. This time, you might be the one crying on my, on my shoulder, but it might be me next time that needs your shoulder to cry on. And so we have to stop teaching this, this rejection and this sort of bullying type of environment that we're in lately. Um, bullying is just stems from us feeling of powerlessness and self-loathing. Um, so I just want people to kind of love themselves enough to love other people. That's a nice message to end on, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much Ooh. for joining me today. <laughs>